Hello, I'm a little confused about something. What are all these students doing here? College students, there must be a thousand of them. Who are you? Are you young Republicans? No! Are you Democrats? No! Then what are you? Students for Liberty! Students for Liberty. Liberty. What does that mean? Well, that's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. Thank you, and thank you, and welcome to a special edition of the Stossel Show. For this show, we've come to the most horrible place in America, <laughs> Washington, D.C. And we're here because these students are here. And this group excites me. They are different from how I was in college. They're from all over the country. And they come here to learn about liberty and good government. And I have to say, I mean, why do you care? You're in college. When I was in college, I cared about sports and girls. <laughs> and public affairs was not on the card. But we're going to hear from you in a minute and learn about that. I mean, you're studying economists like Friedrich Hayek. I, I would have never... Had a clue, but you did. <laughs> but before we hear from the students, uh, I want to introduce you to someone who's taught me a great deal about liberty. David Bowes of the Cato Institute, think tank here in D.C., uh, with a motto, uh, they're dedicated to the dignity of the individual. Why that? What's that mean? Because that's the most important thing in political life, in the relationship of the individual to the state. Every individual has the right and the responsibility to be treated with dignity and respect and to make the important decisions about his or her own life. And, and I think most Americans would say, what are you talking about? The most important thing isn't the individual, that's selfish. The most important thing is that government keep us safe and take care of us and help the weak and the poor. I don't think most people in America do think the government is more important than the individual. Maybe in some parts of the world, I don't think they do in America. Now, most people in America live. want a bigger government than I do. They think that individuals need more help than I think they need, and they think that their own ideas ought to be imposed on people through force. And I don't agree with that, and so those are the things we debate. And what are, in the eyes of the Cato Institute, the big issues threatening the country today? Well, certainly the fact that we're in two wars that have gone on forever, that's a big problem. I'm concerned about sort of a growing trend toward a police state in America that, you know, somebody wrote a book recently called Three Felonies a Day. They said there are so many federal laws and federal regulations, you may be breaking the law every day. And then there's the looming bankruptcy crisis. We're already seeing it in Greece, we're seeing it in Europe, and it's coming here that we simply can't afford all the promises the government has made. And I am going to do a show with this three felonies a day guy. He say I probably commit maybe six because I'm on television, I have an active life. Um, but most Americans say we want government to protect us. We need more regulation. We need government to fix more problems. Well, in fact, if you ask people if we need more regulation, most Americans say we don't. Now, but if, if you, you ask them about... people are on the phone in their cars and they're dying... Well, if you ask about specific regulation, sometimes people do think we need that. And part of that, then, is that's what think tanks do. We study the effects of regulations. And if you were king at the Cato Institute, what laws would you repeal? Well, if I were king, first I would repeal the law that made me king, because... <laughs> And here in, here in Washington, D.C., we should thank George Washington, because they offered to make him a king, and he said no. That's I right. think his successors would have said yes. Well, that's right. So I would, I would start by repealing the laws that give one man that kind of authority. But certainly, let's start by making taxes lower, flatter, and simpler on the way to getting rid of the federal income tax. Let's get rid of the Department of Education. Let's transition away... Let's transition away from a government-mandated retirement plan to a system where people save for their own retirement and end up with a lot more money at age 65 than they do under Social Security. Those are some laws we could repeal. 
All right, let's hear from you. My name's Clint Townsend. I'm from the University of North Texas. Woo! So I'm wondering if there's any historical examples you could point to where uh, social safety nets have been provided in a, a private setting. Sure. There have been books published about the way those systems used to work in both the United States and Great Britain, that there were clubs, there were associations, there were religiously based groups, there were ethnically based groups, the Polish in one neighborhood would have a group, the Jews in another neighborhood would have their group, where they would all put money into a common pool for their friends, relations, club members. And one of the things that happened was when the welfare state came along in both England and the United States, it kind of made these systems redundant. People said, well, I guess we don't need the private system. And now people say, what would we have if it weren't for the welfare state? And the answer is, well, you would have had these systems that the welfare state destroyed. And before the welfare state was created, the poverty was declining quite sharply. After the war on poverty began and welfare, it continued to drop and then stopped progress stopped thanks to these programs and now we say well I might not I don't need to help the poor because there's this 30 billion dollar welfare system taking care of it what can I do we have come a very long way but there still is race gender and uh, economic status inequality so how can we as libertarians address this issue aside from the answer the market will take care of it a lot of what we need to say is, is what you said at the very beginning. We've come a long way. Because sometimes we forget that we are a country of more than 300 million people, the most diverse country probably in the history of the world. And we need to make the point, one of the things that creates a racial gap in America is terrible schools in the inner city. And who provides those schools? The government. What kept black people down in America for many years? First slavery, then Jim Crow. Big government programs. When we got rid of them, there was a lot more equality, a lot more mobility, and so on. What kept women down? Laws that restricted them from certain occupations, and so on. What kept gay people out? Sodomy laws and other laws that discriminated against them. So what we want is, in fact, a free society and a free market, which is not a panacea. It will not be perfect but it's better than the alternatives. Thank you. Yes, sir. I've heard a lot about smaller government in terms of dollars, less spending, less regulation, but I haven't heard a lot of talk about um, a lot of concepts that us, we libertarians care about that don't have dollar values, like the rule of law and equal rights and peace. You're right. A lot of times it does sound like when we say smaller government, we just mean one that taxes and spends less. What I like to talk about is I want to reduce the size, scope, and power of government over individuals. And so absolutely sending people off to war, spending our money, costing people's lives, that's big government. And inequality in marriage law, that's big government that conservatives often support. Um, so there are a lot of areas, that's right, where small government should mean a government that has less intrusiveness into your life. Well, thank you, David Bowes. Thank I have you. to say, I think we're getting our clocks cleaned. Everywhere I turn, they're making government bigger and restricting our freedom. And I look at this presidential race, who can I get excited about? And look at the leaders. Mitt Romney wants to start a trade war with China. Rick Santorum says the state should limit individuals' wants and passions. <laughs> Newt Gingrich wants a more aggressive drug war and wants us to pay to send him to the moon. All that to me is bad news, but there is good news and our next guest will tell us that we have a lot to be excited about. So stay tuned. We're back at the Students for Liberty conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, let's talk about politics. This political season depresses me. It seems like most of the candidates want to make government bigger. They want to go to war with somebody or they want to invade our bedrooms. Uh, 
that's been the trend in politics. But cheer up, says Nick Gillespie of Reason Television and the author of Declaration of Independence, how libertarian politics can fix what's wrong with America. You say there are rays of hope? I, I can think of at least three reasons to be optimistic in the current moment. And one of them is that a record high 40% of Americans, the large, it's a plurality of Americans, refuse to identify as either Republican or Democrat. And in that disaffiliation and saying, I don't want to be seen in public as one of these two things, that's the beginning of great wi wisdom. What What, what we need to understand is that politicians and politics, it's like the Vinnie Barbarino of American life. It is the last, it's the last person through the door. It's the last person to get the joke. The DIY, DIY culture, do-it-yourself culture, a Lady Gaga culture. Republican and Democrat, liberal and conservative, does not offer up the flexibility and the personalization that being a libertarian does. And that's one of the reasons, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons why so many people now are saying, Democrat, Republic, not me. And that's, that's, we should be optimistic about that. So there's skepticism about the Democrats wanting economic police and the Republicans wanting other kinds of police. But when I say I'm a libertarian, people say, huh, what's that? Do you mean libertine? You're in favor of... No, that's, let's not put that down either, okay? But no. But when, you know, I find when you say, look, I am socially tolerant and I'm fiscally responsible. Uh, you know, that gets people's attention because what you're saying is, I don't want to run your bedroom and I don't want to run your boardroom and I certainly don't want to police the world. And then suddenly people are more willing and more interesting to talk to you. I would think so, but there's a Republican governor of a Democratic state who was elected twice by good margins. He left the state in great financial condition. He couldn't make a dent in the Republican primary. I'm talking about Gary Johnson. Yeah, no. Uh, Like, you know, Johnson might not have done well in the Republican primary. He's, he's running for the Libertarian candidate uh, presidential nod, and he'll he'll have some action there. But he's a ray of hope, as are, you know, because this is a guy who said, you know what, we want to we want to uh, shut down the prisons, we want to change the drug laws, we want to open up school choice, we don't want to invade Texas or Arizona. I mean, these are, you know, these are pretty sound principles. But beyond him, and he's out there, and he's more, we know of him more now than we did when he was governor of New Mexico. And, but beyond that, you have people like Ron Paul, you have groups like this. There is a movement growing out there uh, about talking about these ideas and what they mean in real life. And the, you know, one other ray of hope is that we are dead broke at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. And being poor, if you're interested in, in a radical change in government, being poor and being broke should never feel so liberating. <laughs> well, on that yeah. optimistic Impressive. note, let's hear from you students. Do you have questions for Nick Gillespie of Reason Magazine? Go right ahead. My question is, does the future of libertarianism um, reside in the Republican Party or within the context of the two-party system? Or do you feel like libertarians should um, forsake uh, the two-party system and try to go their own way? I think that the future of libertarianism resides in the heart of every malcontent who says, you know what, I want to make a better world, I'm not satisfied with this world, I want to extend my ability to choose the life that I want. So libertarianism is, it will be expressed through politics, but its main focus will not be politics, it will be beyond politics. And I just want to add to your point about Republicans and Democrats. When I was at ABC and I discovered this new movement and, oh, this makes sense to me, and I tried to convince people, I thought, well, the Republicans, the social conservative Republicans will resist this because this is their religion, this is their heart. I can't talk them out of their beliefs. And the liberals, once I explain the economics, that they'll be more open to it. And I have found the opposite has been true. Conservatives welcomed me to their conferences, let me speak at all kinds of social conservative events, they were polite, they might not have entirely agreed, but they wanted to discuss the ideas. My kids went to school with Al Franken's kids. He had this left-wing radio show. I thought I could go on and reason with him. And he was an animal. He just wouldn't let me get a word in edgewise. And my experience has been that the progressives, most of them, their mind is just closed to, to liberty. Yes. 
My name is Stephanie Cifuentes from Florida Golf Coast University. John, you just talked a little bit about how people have like really close mind and you can talk to them. But I feel like one of the roadblocks that we have is the entitlement mentality and that I have a right to a job, an education, have a right to a house, and I feel like that's a huge roadblock to actually be able to progress. Well, I can say right off the bat that you do not have a right to a job or a house or anything else. <laughs> but I also, I question your premise. You know, record highs of people, according to Gallup and other polling services, say we want a government that does less and, pay, and costs less. And I think most people in America know they want to be able to work hard. They don't want to be guaranteed a job. They want to be guaranteed an opportunity. They don't want, I, I can tell you now, as somebody who owns a house, I don't necessarily want to own a house. I want to sell a house. And that's not going to happen. And just for the record, I disagree with Nick, and I agree with your premise. I think we're addicted to this entitled feeling. I think that's what they're rioting about in Greece, where they want to make tiny cuts, but people say, this is mine. And Social Security and Medicare, when my generation retires and bankrupts you, most of my peers feel entitled to all that money. I don't want to uh, step on John's line, but you know, when you retire, you're going to be old and weak. And the rest of us here, we we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna tip the scales in, in our direction. I hope so. Thank you, Nick Gillespie. Now, I should say, most of the students here are not gay. Most are not prostitutes. Uh, many don't gamble or use drugs, but do you want laws that forbid other people to do those things? No! All right, when we return, we're going to look at that and talk to someone who says we libertarians are wrong for saying that. That's next. <laughs> back with the Students of Liberty here in awful Washington, D.C. And I'm a libertarian. Most of these students are libertarians. We tend to agree with conservatives when it comes to government spending, that government should spend less on social programs. But most of us agree with liberals when it comes to things like gay marriage or whether people should be allowed to have to smoke weed or to gamble. Uh, Ken Klukowski of the Family Research Council says we are just wrong about that and government has a role in stopping people from doing these things. So let's do one at a time. The war on drugs. This is a good thing? Well, I think people should, everyone should try and be a good steward of their, of their own body and their own resources. Now, for example, my wife is a, is a practicing emergency room physician, and she has patients every single day that, whose bodies are, are, are ravaged by destructive behaviors that they didn't mean to get involved with, but chemically speaking, it just sucked them in, and it got worse and worse, and often, in fact, people die. There are serious public health consequences And the law reduces that? It causes less violence having a war on drugs? Well, I'll tell you, what you're looking at... But again, under our founding fathers, the states have a vested interest in trying to secure public health and public safety. This isn't about Advil or stuff like that. This is about stuff that even in moderation can put you in an altered mental state where you can kill yourself or others. No one gets hopped up on too much Advil. How about <laughs> sex work? Why can't adults rent out their bodies to somebody else, a prostitute? I mean, quarterbacks do it, boxers do it. Why can't women? <laughs> well, I think there's a real difference. They must all be fans of quarterbacks. Um, I think there's a real difference in a person using their athletic ability and making a livelihood of, uh, out of that. Uh, in contradistinction, I know that's a collegiate word, but these are college students, uh, of, of a lifestyle that, that degrades an individual and reduces them to a commodity, especially in an intimate behavior which is at the heart of procreation, at the heart of the family unit. I think a lot of people would say there's a difference between a quarterback strutting his stuff on a field and, and a woman being put in a victimized or subjugated uh, position where we all know that once you get around the age of 18, if someone's below the age of 18, then you're into sex trafficking. And that, of course, right. is just We're a We're talking about a problem consenting adults. Over. I wasn't talking kids. But you've made your point. And lastly, gay, gay marriage. If the, if the state approves marriages between heterosexual people, why not gays? 
Well, the states are sovereign in that regard, and every chance that the states have had to speak in that regard, where the voters of the states, 30 of them, have adopted, have it's adopted not, it's constitutional not the amendments. It's of a majority, binding. just because we have majority rule. Why can't... Because in this regard... In this regard, the states are sovereign, and the social science is clear that children thrive best not just in a two-parent home, but in a home with a biological father and biological uh, mother. People fall short of that all the time, but government has a vested interest in promoting the ideal, even if we all fall short of it to one extent or another. All right, obviously some of you disagree with Ken Klukowski, who's been kind enough to come here. You said that we should try to be good stewards of our own bodies. Why does then the government have the right to tell me what to do with my body? How am I being my own steward if there's a law that says I can't? Well, there's a question in terms of what it is that you want to do. You live in a state, you get to vote for the people who make the laws under which you live. If you don't like it, you can vote them out. Hello, my name is Gilles Verstraten. I come from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Now, there are a number of European... Belgium? Yes. Over there, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Far over. That Belgium. Now, there are a number of European countries who have, to an extent, legalized the use of drugs. I'm thinking of Portugal, more well-known Netherland, the Netherlands, and even my country to an extent as well. On the whole, a legalization seems to reduce problems with drugs. How do you feel about this? How do you... What do you think of these statistics? I've not seen data that I regard as conclusive in that regard, but again, in our, but in our democratic process, that's why everyone gets to go out there and make the case for their data, not just regarding drugs, regarding government spending, regarding taxes, re regarding whether we should have Obamacare, and then we get to decide as a people uh, what we're going to do. But so if that's you the saw data of freedom. That, that you had to say, wow, this is really pretty good, would that change your mind? Regarding legalizing drugs? Yes. I think then at that point, I personally still wouldn't think that's behavior that people should be engaged with, but I would respect the right of every voter to be able to give whatever weight to that evidence they want and to vote accordingly. Hello, my name is Jennifer Jones, and I'm from Salem College in North Carolina. I have a question regarding what you were talking about with your wife working in the healthcare field. Mm. So if you're really concerned about health and looking at it through a more educational lens and showing people how to cause the least amount of damage if they're going to do this, or how to do this in a more safe environment? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure for certain hard drugs like heroin, I don't know what moderate use looks like or, or, if, or, or what exactly the health risks are in, in terms of that. But my take would be that if states as a public health and public safety and social welfare matter think that hard drugs being legalized in society is harmful to society, then they have a right through the democratic process to, to restrict or eliminate those. So it, it's a public policy choice. Thank you, Ken Klukowski. When, when we return, some people want to kill us, and that's why people say we have to have troops in Germany, Korea, all over Europe, and a war in Afghanistan, Iraq, maybe in Iran. When we come back, we'll debate that. <laughs> Welcome back to the Students for Liberty conference. Now, defense. We're libertarians. We think government should do less, but defense is something the government is supposed to do. But should it do so much? Should we have our troops in so many countries? Should we be in Afghanistan, Iraq? Now they're talking about us going into Iran. Ambassador John Bolton says we maybe should spend more. Why? Because the purpose of a defense budget is to protect the United States from threats against us. And I'll say this, as somebody who profoundly believes in individual liberty, the most important way to defend individual liberty in the world is to defend the United States. All right, but we are spending more 
adjusted for inflation than we spent when the Soviets had all those missiles pointed at us. No, actually we're not. In terms of gross national product and percentage of the national budget. In terms of, of percentage budget, of the economy, we're not. But that's because the economy's grown. In terms of adjusted for inflation dollars, we are. Well, but the, the question is, what is the nature of the threats uh, that we're defending against and what are the capabilities we need to do that? Uh, if you look at the threat of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological, turning away from these threats uh, isn't going to solve the problem. The rest of the world isn't going to wait for us to solve our domestic economic situation. Is the war in Iraq a good thing? Was that right to do? The overthrow of Saddam Hussein was clearly the right thing to do. He was a threat to international peace and security. Once free of international weapons inspectors and UN sanctions, which he was on the verge of doing, he unquestionably would have returned to his long pursuit of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. More than 10 years in Afghanistan. I mean, even I thought it was right to go to retaliate after 9-11, but 10 years, are we winning hearts and minds? Well, I don't think that should be our objective in Afghanistan, and I think there is legitimate criticism. It's, it's right both, that we're there? Both, let me finish, both with respect to Iraq and Afghanistan, that nation building was a failed strategy. But the nature of the adversary we face in Afghanistan is one that's difficult to win in a conventional sense in a short time. So we should stay there, not pull out, as Obama says he will do. The, the, we don't determine the nature or the extent or the length of the threat against us. We had troops in Western Europe for decades after World War II because of the threat of the Warsaw Pact. We still have them there. Is that a good thing? And, and we could move some of them uh, be, because right now we don't face the threat there. There's no doubt about it. You have to look at the strategic situation. So why do we have 50,000 soldiers in Germany? I, I would move them, fr frankly, but I would put them somewhere else closer to the front line. And now Iran. Uh, some people say we should attack them before they get the bomb. You I certainly agree with that. So we should go to... Easy, easy. We, we should go to war against a country much bigger than Iraq and then pry the yet-to-be-invented weapon from their cold, dead uh, hands. No, of course not. What we, should, what we should do is strike preemptively against key elements of their nuclear weapons program, break their control over the nuclear fuel cycle, and prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. Let me ask you a question. What is your tolerance for risk of having nuclear weapons in the hands of religious fanatics? My tolerance level is zero. Well, I don't like it, but Pakistan has them, right? Some of them are. So let's have fanatics. some more. Let, let's have Iran. Let's have Syria. Let's have Saudi Point Arabia. Ever. Let's have Egypt. Let's have Turkey. How many countries do you want to have nuclear weapons? None. The, the, the only difference between you and me is that I'd only like one country to have nuclear weapons. On that note, I invite you students to weigh in. Go. Yes, sir. Hi, Casey Given from the University of California, Berkeley. Mr. Ambassador, you seem very concerned with individual rights, but I'm very interested in the individual rights of American citizens. Because of the war on terror, the executive branch now claims the power to detain and assassinate American citizens without any check by the, by the legislature. Could you please comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. This, this is part of a war on terrorism, and it is a different paradigm than robbing, robbing the corner grocery store. There's a law of criminal activity, and there's a law of war. And in the paradigm of war, which is where these uh, uh, events occur, that sort of activity is perfectly permissible, as it is to kill, as it is, as it is to kill enemy soldiers. They don't get Miranda rights read to them, nor should they. Does that mean that anyone that the Pentagon and President Obama says is a threat, they could be killed? Of course not. You have to be able to demonstrate that if somebody has taken up arms against the United States or is uh, in a state of war against them. And that is what the military commissions are designed to demonstrate. If somebody says, somebody in this audience just gets picked up, you have the opportunity to, to demonstrate you're not against the United States. But if you're in the front line in Afghanistan fighting with the Taliban, uh, you have forfeited your rights under that paradigm. Hello, my name is Carlos. I'm from the Arizona State University. 
Uh, my question is, aren't we less likely to go to war with countries that we voluntarily and freely exchange with rather than threaten and sanction? Well, I think it's... <laughs> it's and your reference here is Iran, that by having sanctions, we're more likely to have war when goods cross borders, armies don't. You know, it was a theory uh, written about by the president of Columbia University before World War I that global conflict in the West was essentially impossible because there were so many trade linkages, Europe and America would never go to war again. So he was wrong 100 years ago, and that theory hasn't gotten any better with age. The government of Iran, which is a government of religious fanatics, has demonstrated by decades of behavior since it took power in 1979 that it is a threat to its neighbors and the world as a whole and that its word can't be trusted. That's how I deal with them. My name is Kara LaRose, I'm from the York College of Pennsylvania, and I just wanted you to further comment on how exactly um, you think that our military and our government can justify that we've had 10 years spent on something that, you know, September 11th was obviously devastating and it did take lives, but I feel like we've spent a lot more money and we've taken even more lives trying to retaliate. And so just like the, the amount of time, how do you feel that that is uh, I'll answer it. Uh, I'll answer it this way with respect to the Taliban in Afghanistan. They have a saying about us. They say, you have the watches, we have the time. So we're going to be there for a hundred years? <laughs> How long will it take to make us safe? You tired of it already? <laughs> I'm not, because I don't want another 9-11. I don't want another 9-11. Uh, for me, for my children, or anybody else in America. And it is our right and our obligation to protect our innocent lives from this terrorist attack. I, f I feel that as a profound moral obligation. I worry that we're more likely to have another 9-11 because we have <laughs> troops in their country. Well, that, that, is, that is the attitude that Gene Kirkpatrick back in 1984, referring to the Democratic Convention in San Francisco that year, uh, talked about the San Francisco Democrats always finding fault with the United States. And as she put it, they always blame America first. And they were wrong then, and you're wrong today. Okay. Yes, sir. In 2009, uh, I deployed to Iraq as a member of 3rd Ranger Battalion. And uh, while I was there, a corporal in my company was killed by a 13-year-old with an SKS. They weren't going after a 13-year-old. I have little brothers, and I also have guns. And if my country was invaded, I hope my little brother would have the guts to defend me if they came to haul me off with a black bag, which is what we were doing. We were black bagging people and confiscating their guns, just being you know, the jackbooted thugs. And uh, so what I want to ask you, sir, is how do you feel about the concept of blowback, the idea that they're really only fighting us because we're over there, because that's what I saw when I was in Iraq. We're, we're <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I think you've done a grave disservice to the hundreds of thousands of other Americans who served with honor in Iraq, who followed, who followed our military law and doctrine, who did not harm innocent civilians and fought for the defense of this country. Uh, and if there are abuses, I'm sure you brought them to the attention of your higher authority. Uh, or if you didn't, you should bring them to the public's attention now. Because in our country, when people violate our military law and doctrine, they're prosecuted for it. All right. Thank you, John Bolton. Uh, when we return, more from the Students for Liberty and also a comedian, a rare one, who actually gets it. Coming up.
Welcome back to the Students for Liberty conference. I'm joined again by David Bowes of the Cato Institute. This is the whole section for questions or comments, so come on up to the microphone. We'll continue the discussion. Gabrielle Scheiner from Queen Mary University of London. Um, when you present these ideas, initially a lot of people say they're too selfish or too individualistic. But this weekend, I've met people from almost every continent. So I'm wondering what you think it is about these ideas that are bringing together people from all over the world. People everywhere just want to be free. <laughs> and I know what we often find is that people don't necessarily want other people to be free. I find very few people who say to me, I don't know how to choose a good school for my child, so I'm glad the government does it for me. <laughs> I find very few people who say to me, if the government would allow us only one brand of computer, then I wouldn't have to make up my mind which one to buy. <laughs> I hear very few people who say, I wish we could go back to the days when there was just one phone company and one kind of telephone. So people generally want freedom and choice in their own lives, but somehow they don't think other people know how to choose who to marry, know how to choose what to smoke, know how to choose what to read or where to send their kid to school or how to save for retirement. But the fact is that all over the world in 1989 in the Soviet Empire, in 2011 in the Arab world, people want to be free and when they get a chance to try to demand it, they do. My name is Alex Biles. I'm a recent graduate of uh, the University of Michigan. Um, and it's not too long since Occupy Wall Street was in the news. Uh, regardless of our opinion of the movement, um, the facts do show a concentration of wealth moving towards the 1% um, of the population and uh, in the U.S. Should libertarians be concerned about income inequality and what's the, your solution? Well, interestingly enough, if you look at graphs that go far enough back, it's clear that the concentration of wealth was greater in like the 1920s than it is today. So it has not been a steady increase. Uh, it was more concentrated then. There was a decline in concentration. More recently, there has been some increase in concentration. Should we worry about it? I'm not sure. One thing I notice is that on any given day that the price of Microsoft stock goes up, inequality increases. Because Bill Gates gets richer, and the rest of us, even if we own Microsoft stock, we only get a little bit richer. So am I worried about that day? No, I have a little bitty bit of Microsoft stock, so I got a little better off that day. But still, inequality increased. Does that bother me? No, not really. However, when we have a system where the entire, uh, the entirety of big business is considered too big to fail, so that if an automobile company or a bank or an insurance company is threatened with failure, the government bails them out. But if your father's car dealership or your shoe shine stand is threatened with failure, nobody bails you out. That's a bad system, and that absolutely is increasing inequality and increasing resentment for good reason. And if I would just say, I would just add to that: if we believe in freedom, freedom will lead to inequality. I'm only bothered by it because so many people are so upset by it and they're using it as an excuse to clamp down on the capitalism that's made us prosperous and that helps poor people. And it's in their guts. It just feels unfair. But life isn't fair. Some of you are really good looking and some of you are not. <laughs> and you who are good looking will have advantages in life. That's not fair. But it's not a role for government to fix that. Just to have even rules. All right, on that note, who wants some candy here? All right, yeah, everybody likes free stuff, right? And speaking of free stuff, you know, have you remember the, the Willy Wonka song, The Candy Man? Well, who is the real candy man? That's coming up next. Welcome back to the last segment from the Students for Liberty conference. I notice most comedians, entertainers, they tend to be big government people for whatever reason. But now and then you run across someone who makes you say, wow, somebody who really gets it. And that's Tim Hawkins. So please join us and I'll let you tell your own story. All right. Crank it, bro. Let's do this. Whoa, who can take your money? Who can take your money? 
With a twinkle in their eye. Take it all away and give it to some other guy. The government. The government. The government can. Oh, who can tax the sunrise? Who can tax the trees? Let you run a business and collect up all the fees. The government. Oh, the government can. And the government can cause they mix it up with lies and make it all taste good. The government takes everything we make to pay for all of their solutions like health care, climate change, pollution just throw away the Constitution I wrote that line, thank you and who can give a bailout tell us to behave and make the founding fathers roll over in their grave I don't care if you hate me, I'm going to sing it anyway oh the government can and the government can't cause they mix it up with lies and make it all yummy, 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 yummy.